So today we are going to talk about uh, the history of personality testing, at least to give you some context. I won't be able to cover everything, but I'll at least talk about the early rise as well as some super popular ones. Okay. Before we even go into kind of this nice structure, uh, let's define what a trait is. So these are relatively enduring dispositions, uh, so a tendency to think or feel in a certain manner, as well as behave in a given circumstance. Uh, for those of you who have taken my personality class, uh, personality is kind of the expression of individual differences through thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. It's the same idea. This is something that we differ on. Uh, these aren't temporary fleeting states. These are stable. And interest, but let's like actually give you some roadmap here. So the interest in personality has changed over the decades. It slowly rose through the 1920s. It seemed to taper off in the 30s, and then it started to rise again in the 40s. Um, but in all these cases, they were aimed at measuring those stable dispositions. So the first kind of example that I'm going to talk about, because uh, while there were some rudimentary assessment methods, like free association that were used before the 20th century by like Galton, uh, Kraepelin, sorry, my tripod, and others, it wasn't until World War I that personality tests emerged to any form of resemblance to their contemporary, like, counterparts today, like on the BuzzFeed. Um, they've, got, they've, they've made a long difference. So, it, like, it's as so happened often with the history of testing, it was once again a practical need that served to, um, as the impetus for this new method. So, modern personality testing began with Woodworth's personal data sheet. It was an attempt at an instrument for detecting which army recruits were susceptible to psychoneurosis, aka shell shock. Um, this test, which, oh. This test, which was first published in 1919, consisted of 16 questions that the subject could answer by underlying, underlining yes or no. The questions were exclusively of the, quote, face obvious variety, and for the most part involved fairly serious symptomology, which we'll learn face validity is not validity. Um, but it was designed to screen out soldiers who would be um, inclined to or at least predisposed to shell shock. So representative items, I'll show you on the next page. This is my sad attempt at an Excel version. Um, included, uh, do ideas run through your head so fast that you cannot sleep? Um, were you considered a bad boy? Uh, are you bothered by a feeling that things are not real? Do you have a strong desire to commit suicide? Now, I've also reproduced the first six questions, just so you can get a sense of the exposure. Now, I wasn't able to really nicely replicate the, like, yes-no underlining. Excel has its limitations. Um, and this type of question system of yes-no um, is going to start, it's going to be remnant. When we get to the MMPI, you're going to want to remember this test, because there's a lot of similarities here. Now, obviously, I mean, frankly, this test didn't see a lot of action because, well, World War I ended pretty quickly after this test was published. But it still laid the foundations for this idea that you could assess dispositions. Now, their ideas of what an accessible disposition was is a little different here, but... That's, that's the idea. Um, so, I'll just let you read through these, and um, there should be a URL that I can link so you can actually take one to get a full sense of the hundred and some odd items. Now, next, so while 
Americans were like super into objective personality testing. There's a young Swiss psychiatrist, Hermann Rorschach, um, was born in 1884, he ends up dying in 1922, who was developing a completely different mechanism for studying personality. So Rorschach's, um, this Jungian, or he's influenced strongly by Jungian and psychoanalytic thinking, so it's natural that it makes sense that his new approach would focus on ten the tendency for patients to reveal their innermost conflicts unconsciously when responding to ambiguous stimuli. The Rorschach and other projective tests, including the most popular, like the thematic apperception test, were per- predicated on this projective hypothesis that when responding to ambiguous or unstructured stimuli, we inadvertently discuss our innermost needs, fantasies, and conflict. Now, the basic structure of this, I've hopefully included a video giving you some um, example of this being administered. One of the nice things about early footage is it's out of copyright, so I can kind of embed it. But the basic idea is that a subject is given a visual prompt and asked to interpret the image. Those interpretations, those those responses are interpreted by the clinician. And Rorschach was pretty convinced that people revealed their most important personality dimensions in their responses to his ink plots. He spent years and years getting the exact good set of 10 ink plots that I will show you in another module. Uh, and systematically analyze the responses to personal friends different and different patients. Now, he published this in 1921. Uh, it was approached with some general suspicion. There was The first systematic study wasn't seriously done until 1932, which is a decade after Rorschach's death. So because of the timing of his death, it was up to others to kind of complete this work. And so I'll show you the inkblots. They're out of copy right now. And it laid the foundation for the thematic apperception test uh, by Henry Murray, who I'll talk about in a bit. So here's card two of the uh, psychodiagnostic plates. The red details of card two are often seen as blood and are the most distinctive features. Responses to them can be can provide indications about how a subject is likely to manage their feelings of anger or physical harm. And I quote, according to the the documentation, this card can induce a variety of sexual responses. Now, the most popular responses for this are, depending on the study you look at, uh, two humans or some four-legged animal, including, like, dog, elephant, or bear. And for those of you who've played what might be the best video game ever, this plate um, inspired a lot of cool stuff in Fallout New Vegas. But that might be before your time. I encourage you to check out that game. It is amazing. Okay, so let's talk about the thematic apperception test. Um, this is by Henry Murray and Christina Morgan in 1935. Um, Rorschach's test was originally developed to reveal the innermost workings of the abnormal subject uh, versus the TAT, the thematic apperception test, was designed as an instrument to study normal and typical, excuse me, typical personality. So, of course, um, since both have since been expanded to cover the entire continuum of human human behavior, but um, subjects were presented with ambiguous pictures, but these pictures were more structured than the Rorschach ink plots. I've got one on the next slide um, that I think I'm allowed to. Um, the TAT depicts a series of pictures where persons are engaged in an ambiguous interaction. And the subject is shown the picture at a time and then told to make up 
a story about it. They are instructed to be as dramatic as possible. They're also asked um, to, that story is asked to include what led up to the event shown, what is happening in the moment, what the characters are feeling and thinking, as well as what the outcome of the story was. Ta-da. Um, and this is kind of the last little prehistory before we kind of get diving in. Uh, the second coming of the structured test. So beginning in the 1940s, personality testing uh, began to flourish as useful tools for clinical evaluation as well as for assessment of normal the normal spectrum of functioning. Probably because a lot of statistical advances were made in this time, uh, the factor analysis was now able to be done kind of on a computer, although the, what a computer was is a little different than it is now. Um, but the idea still was that structured tests started to become popular, and they still are today. Now, probably the most famous and most researched test of this genre is the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. It was initially conceived to facilitate psychiatric diagnoses. Um, initial like papers on this, 1940, 1942, before it's like officially produced and released in 1943. So it kind of did away with the idea, like it, it addressed some of the concerns with the Woodworth personal data inventory, which made too many assumptions. Uh, instead, it, its philosophy was the meaning of the test response could only be determined through empirical research. No assumptions. Let the data tell you um, what it can tell you. As in, like They would identify known groups, those who had clinical disorders and those who didn't, and see if there were questions that could distinguish between the two. Um, so, subsequently, there have been numerous empirical-based true-false inventories that are based on this assessment, uh, ranging from personal and social adjustment, pre-employment screenings of individuals in high-risk law enforcement positions, testing of patients in medical and substance abuse settings, evaluations of persons in forensic or courtroom proceedings, and appraisal of college students for career counseling. Many other useful tests followed alongside this path-breaking measure. Um, it's now in its second edition. They've addressed many of the known group problems where they would uh, compare uh, healthy controls who all happen to be, or not entirely, but often farm boys compared to patients in a psychiatric facility. There, there are some other differences between these groups uh, in an urban psychiatric facility. There's some differences here. Um, but I'm going to talk about the 16 personality factor questionnaire. This was based on factor analysis, which we are going to talk so much about because I love factor analysis. And it's also a really great technique um, used to find the minimum number of dimensions or factors to explain a large number of variables. Uh, so Ray, Raymond B. Cattell, um, did a lot of this work. Uh, that's the youngest picture I could find of him. Um, and this was often the biggest alternative uh, to the MMPI. Uh, so this is a test derived from fact, I already said that, useful for evaluation of both normal and abnormal personality. Now, there's this thing called the California Personality Inventory that was a spin-off of the MMPI that tried to, like, balance the two. But, eh, that's neither here nor there. So, anyway, what he did was he got lots of questions and he reduced them to a set number of factors. And deemed these the... 16 essential traits. And as a result, he created the 16PF, uh, which is 
essentially 16 personality factor questionnaire. Now I've included all um, 16 of these factors. You are welcome to pause uh, here and read them. I'm not going to because uh, I don't want to and you are, it's, you don't need me to read you a list. But the one thing I will point out here is that the names of the factors are literally the letters of the alphabet. They, and this is actually going to come back to bite uh, personality psychology later. This, because the names of these factors weren't like the trait they were describing, instead were like the A factor instead of the warmth factor, ends up being a big criticism in Walter Michel's um, major book on the on personality and major criticisms, including that there's no theory behind it and it's just an alphabet soup of factors. Uh, so if you want to learn more, check out my personality class or uh, just, well, look at the videos. I have a lot of them on this. Yeah, there are 16 of them. After uh, the O scale, they just use Q for all of them. Uh, again, I'm not going to read these to you. But I'm going to hold them on the screen for a little bit, at least like five seconds or so. Uh, and I encourage you to check it out and take the test yourself. Here's the link. And uh, this is indeed a picture of Ray Cattell or the cat. It seems only fitting. So, yeah. I'll see you later.